In spiritual practice, there are all kinds of stages. It is very much like a train that moves with all its stops toward its final destination. What is meant here? For example, let's imagine a high-speed train running from Tokyo to Hakata. Suppose this Shinkansen train leaves Tokyo and makes stops in the following order, Nagoya, Kyoto, Osaka, then Okayama, Hiroshima, then Kakura, and Hakata. It departs Tokyo and stops in Nagoya, Kyoto, and Osaka in order. Consider these stops one by one as your consciousness on each level. And then what? For example, the train leaves Tokyo and arrives at Nagoya Station. And that Nagoya Station is beautifully decorated. Then when the train leaves the station, the passenger thinks, if Nagoya Station is so decorated, then Kyoto Station must be even more beautiful. And let's say Kyoto Station is even more beautiful. He thinks, oh, that's great. If Kyoto Station is beautiful because it's even prettier, Osaka Station must be even better. Meanwhile, the Osaka Station, because of earthquakes and another, was so destroyed that it was hardly visible. Then this passenger would think, I had to leave Tokyo and arrive in Osaka. And even though I am here, Osaka Station is ruined. Even if I go on to Okuyama, Hiroshima, Kakura, and Hakata, it will no doubt be terrible there. Our consciousness is multi-layered. For example, even if a person's surface consciousness is pure and beautiful, what is in the slightly deeper layer of consciousness, what is in the even deeper layer? What is in the subconscious, what is in the superconscious, that is, what is in each of the levels of his consciousness, is unknown. And spiritual practice is what first of all allows one to go deep into the depths of each of these layers of consciousness, i.e. makes it possible to exist there. Next comes the understanding of these layers of consciousness, stopping them and destroying them. I often plunge from surface consciousness into the absence of light, the anti-mystical force, into the world without forms. In doing so, I experience first a luminous space and then a gradual plunge deeper. Also, breaking through the absence of light is very difficult because there is nothing but darkness in that absence of light. Further, before I understood all kinds of bardo, I thought as follows. This is a dark space. It must be the pollution of my soul. In other words, my meditation has been going well up to this point, and now my meditation is going badly. There must be issues with extraneous thoughts in my current way of meditating. However, as I continued to meditate, I noticed that this was not the case, that it all represented an accumulation of my karma. This was because I clearly understood and realized the multiple layers of consciousness. Monks often ask me this question, until yesterday I was able to practice and today I cannot. Or, a month ago my practice was fine, but my current practice is failing. Maybe I'm not good for anything else. This is just a typical example of what today's lecture is about. That is, the surface consciousness has to some extent studied the teachings, has to some extent accumulated merit, has to some extent mastered meditation, and is pure. So in that part, you get meditation, you get study of the teachings, and, you can accumulate merit. But in the deep layers of consciousness, there is a lot of impurity. In that case, if one enters the space of that consciousness, then he sinks into a similar state. And then he stops meditation. Or one starts to break precepts. Here there is a need to talk briefly about what this or that color that you see means. First, the Tantric Sutras say that the smoky color symbolizes hell. But I think hell is a black color. My own experience tells me that. Then, it's a little complicated. The light is scattered in two layers. The light seen below eye level is a little transparent and faint. It signifies our worldly desires. Next, the light that spreads into the space that is slightly above eye level. It expresses the state of sublimation of these worldly desires of ours. However, it should be understood that they are both illusions of our greed, hate, and ignorance. Next, the green one. This green signifies compromise, 
a state of consciousness in which one loses to the strong. It signifies the state of mind of the animal. Next, yellow. This yellow signifies greed, and also various desires for material things. These are factors of hungry spirits. Next, blue. The color blue can also be different, from dark blue to pure sparkling blue. About this blue color in Tibetan Buddhism, it is often said, be reborn in the world of men. The reason is that there you can engage in spiritual practice. This blue color signifies the world of people, attachment, and religion as an extreme degree of attachment. Next, the color red. It includes shades from red to purple and expresses pure struggle. What does pure struggle mean? In short, it is trying hard to think only of winning. Next, the sparkling gold color, as if assembled from golden threads. It expresses the energy of the playful outgrowth as a manifestation of the merits that have overwhelmed such a person. Thus, for example, as you begin your practice, you see black. You see green. You see yellow. These states. I did not explain the orange one yet. It expresses sexual desire. Or reddish brown. Brown is the color of a very low energy state. It also expresses sexual desire. If a person rejoices when he sees something like that, it certainly means that he has seen his inner pollution, his worldly desires. So this should be rejoiced over. But this is nothing but worldly desires, and it just shows that the goal has increased by one more unit. In other words, for example, there was a sexual desire in me. For example, there were elements of the animal in me. I had an attachment in me. I had hell in me. You come to a state where you finally understand this. So what does one have to do to attain ultimate liberation? What do you have to do to be able to take your practice to the last step? So, what must one do to become a true saint and be able to bring all souls to the world of true bliss? First of all, to do this, one must discard all of one's current experience or level. Discard means to treat it with the consciousness of Zanki, modesty repentance. What, then, is called modesty repentance? It is to ceaselessly meekly and discreetly accept what you are experiencing, your spiritual practice, your various aspects of character, your practical activity, your superiority over others, and to think that it is not yet enough. And also to repent unceasingly of your own words, thoughts, and deeds. In other words, your thoughts, words, and actions are always capable of expressing your remorse humbly in relation to external existence. This is the beginning and the end of spiritual practice. And this is what is called modesty repentance consciousness. There are two types of practitioners, those who express themselves and those who do not. To get to the final point, one must not express oneself. The example of Sakyamuni Buddha keeping a vow of silence for three and a half years is telling of this. It is also well known that the saints of Tibet and the saints of India went through the vow of silence in a similar way and received a return of karma. For example, in the case of Sakyamuni Buddha, when he continued the practice of silence, many mocked him, for example by calling him deaf. They would say, he's deaf. He's a beggar. It is said that he was mocked in various ways, and this ultimately polished the Buddha Sakyamuni Buddha's state, which is very much like the process of turning an ordinary stone into a beautiful gemstone when it is washed in running water and polished. The same is true of our actions, speech, and thoughts. Our actions, speech, and thoughts have been contaminated by a lot of karma since the beginningless past. Our essence, however, is a sparkling Buddha's state. To be able to polish off the matrix of the winner in truth means to live in this society receiving the return of karma, to be humbly aware of oneself in whatever conditions one finds oneself in. Without regard to the environment, to be constantly aware of the workings of one's speech, actions and soul, to live politely, kindly, based on the law, based on the truth, this is what gives the perfection of true Buddha. In other words, to get to the ultimate point, it becomes necessary to study the teachings thoroughly, control one's words carefully, 
control one's thoughts carefully, and control one's actions carefully. And the basis of this is modesty repentance, as I just mentioned. The fact that I don't appear to you very often is because you are still far from having the foundation of truth. There may be a point of view that if there is no foundation of truth, you have to show up and preach many laws. But if you give two, three, five, or ten laws to a person who does not understand even one law, it is the same as giving one, three, five, ten plates to someone who simply has no appetite and throw away it all. Once again, let's tidy up today's conversation. First, consciousness is multi-layered. And the important thing is, first of all, to find out which parts of consciousness have which impurities and not at all that the deeper you go, the greater the luminosity. If you recognize that, then in the next stage the important thing is to destroy those impurities. So, in the process of spiritual practice, different phenomena arise. Mental powers disappear, anger arises, or tears appear. Or you see a different color, different light. However, none of this makes any difference. First of all, it should be understood that all of this is merely an experience that emerges in the process of spiritual practice, necessary to know one's own elements. Further, to develop and give perfection to the space of absolute light of the ultimate point, this space of absolute light, the space of great and expansive light, the space of deep light, is the goal of our spiritual practice. And the ultimate point of practice is to merge our soul with the space of causal, which contains the suffering of all souls. To reach this end point, it is necessary to possess modesty repentance. It is important to make an effort to continually recognize and destroy one's pollution of greed, hate, and ignorance, the pollution of greed, hate, and ignorance in deeds, speech, and thought. And this requires three factors, merit, meditation, and study of the teachings. Among those here, and today are people who are now doing practice, and those who are now doing bhakti to accumulate merit, or those who are doing both practice and bhakti equally. From my talk today, I believe it should be clear what these different people gathered here need to do in what they do, what they need to practice, what they need to think about, what they need to study. First of all, realize as a prerequisite that you are inherently contaminated. Also realize that the ignorance, greed, and hate that emerge in the process of practice exist within a deeper state of layered consciousness in which you do not now exist. You also need to realize that destroying them is a spiritual practice. When such things come to the surface, you can't have your soul come into discord from it. For example, there are often people who say, I'm no longer good at spiritual practice, I want to be brought back to bhakti. Or, I didn't succeed with my spiritual practice, so I want to go back to the world. When I was a layman, I could practice. I used to have a much better meditative experience. What do you think? Is this the right thing to do? All of this is nothing more than stopping along the way as you gradually enter from your own superficial consciousness into deep consciousness. You are liberated when you arrive from Tokyo at the Hakata station. The important thing is that the Hakata station itself is also irrelevant. When you get off at Hakata station, when you are released from the train, you find true freedom, happiness, and joy. Does that make sense? Next, we now have a little by little opening and giving you the highest teachings of the two great strands of Buddhism. The southern and northern traditions, represented by the great sutra collection of the southern tradition and the Tibetan tantric sutras. But since originally, whether it is the southern tradition or the northern tradition, it is the teaching of the great, perfect, absolute Buddha Sakyamuni. Transmitted to the south and the north, I think that their fusion will give you the opportunity to know true Buddhism. And I think that whether or not you can become a merit holder to know true Buddhism is the dividing line between whether or not you can continue in spiritual practice. Buddhism sets as its goal the extent to which in the final point you overcome death, the extent to which by rising above death you become immortal. This means transcending the three bardo I spoke of recently, entering the world without forms, they are continually stabilizing the state of light and creating factors of breadth, 
boundlessness, and depth. Wishing that my disciples who have listened to this lecture today, having reformed their souls as of today, may become successors to true Buddhism, or become heirs to the bequests of true Buddhism, and in the future become souls radiating great light, I conclude my lecture. For as many people as possible to come across this information, please like it, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment of 8 words or more.